And we are joined now by some of the members of the community group that hosted the event at the Strand Theater last week. Connie Willey is the executive director of the Champlain Valley Family Center that provides treatment and counseling to drug addicts. Dr. Ken Hall is chief medical officer at the University of Vermont Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital in Plattsburgh. And Christine Peters is the director of legal and social services at Clinton County Department of Social Services here in Plattsburgh. Welcome to you all. We appreciate you Thank being you. here. That was an incredible turnout last week. It was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. Nearly a thousand people coming out on a rainy Tuesday night to, to hear about this epidemic. And, and really, it is an epidemic for, yeah. for, for the area. The driving point of um, the event was to really stress that this is our community's problem. That was really uh, overwhelmed. And the sheer interest in the event was great. When we talked with then police chief, former police chief uh, Desmond Rassico a few months ago, he said he didn't think that a lot of people in the area really had a grasp of how serious this was. Is, is that true and is, is, is that what events like this are designed to do to really raise the public awareness? I, I believe so. Um, you know, I, I, in terms of looking at the opiate crisis that we have in this county, and looking at a, a clinic like ours where in 2011 we were just starting to see a little bit of the opiate diagnoses come into our clinic and in 2016 well over 50 percent of everybody who came in had an opiate diagnosis. You know most of the uh, publicity or, or, or community awareness came from reading police beats and it is so much more than that when you take a look at the opiate crisis in our county and how our families are being impacted in ways that nobody would have thought of six years ago. The point was made at your event that it is almost hard for an individual not to be touched in some way by it in, in this day and age. Absolutely. If they don't have a, a, yeah. a loved one who is addicted, they know somebody, they have a, a friend, coworker, a friend. Yeah, yeah. Mm. A, a employee, um, you name it. Uh, all of those relationships are impacted by this opiate crisis. And in other ways, they may be affected by things like crime. Uh, That's right. Addicts right. need hundreds of dollars, uh, in some cases every day, uh, to support, to support the their addiction. And there is an increase in, in crime that we've seen uh, that goes along with that. That's correct. I think, you know, certainly Jason made that point uh, mm -hmm. in the Chasing the Dragon that that's where he got his his low point. You know, he was involved in crime, and and you know, Captain LaFountain has said over and over, this is our problem not only because people are dying, but because you know, first of all, people are dying. That's mm -hmm. obviously a concern. But anyone who is involved in opiates has to they have to support their habit, and eventually they'll turn to crime. And Captain LaFountain is Captain Bob LaFountain yes. with the New York State Police. Yes. And they talk openly about how they have seen an increase in petty crime, people breaking in the homes and the cars, uh, trying to get uh, the money that they need to support their habit. Mm -hmm. right. And you also talk about the number of deaths. Do you think people would be surprised to hear the number of overdose deaths just here in this area, in the city of Plattsburgh and in this region, uh, the, the dozens that, that are now uh, being uh, tallied up every year. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I think just the overdose, overdose death statistic itself, you know, being between 80 and 90 people a day in the United States die of drug overdoses. That's amazing. And, you know, fortunately, the, uh, the overdoses all are not always fatal in terms of there's been a huge increase in Narcan reversals. Um, and thanks to CVPH Hospital and Alliance for Positive Health for really doing a lot of training and uh, implementing uh, Narcan and, and getting it in the public's hands. And it's becoming more and more available. Before you would be able to find it at a hospital, police officers would carry it in their cruisers. But we're seeing it right. in more and more places now. Caregivers, families of addicts can have it on hand. So that's a good thing. People can now have it Abs right at their fingertips. Correct. That's what the Alliance for Positive Health is doing in, in terms of, of training uh, people to so that they can give it to loved ones. Christine, you mentioned the uh, the documentary that was shown the other night at the Strand, Chasing the Dragon. This is a really vivid, intense 
documentary. I mean, they, this isn't sugar-coated at all. This, this shows it as it is, how it impacts addicts and their families. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, it is very graphic. They show uh, individuals shooting up. They show people who are at their worst points. Um, they talk about very graphic, um, very graphic things that happen to them, Die, you know, people overdosing, losing relatives. So um, I think the good thing about that, even though it's tough to watch, it's graphic, is it's real. And, and this is really what it looks like. One of the most powerful uh, messages that I got out of it was really in the first three to five minutes where each of the individuals that they interview throughout talk about their, their childhood and the fact they had normal childhoods, that they, you know, one was an Eagle Scout, you know, one played soccer. They were, these are kids like we have kids and they are kids f that we could identify with and, you know, there but for the grace of God, you know, could go any of us. And, and that's part of, of alleviating the stigma is that it could be any of us. In Chasing the Dragon, there's a statistic which I think really is, it really epitomizes what this epidemic is now as opposed to what it was previ in previous right, years. Back in the 60s and 70s. Yes, in the <coughs> 60s and 70s, most people started with heroin. Now, this opioid crisis starts with legitimate legalized painkillers, and then a person may turn to heroin because A, it's a cheaper alternative, and B, they, they need to maintain so they don't get sick. It's, uh, it's almost not about the high anymore. It's really just about right. not being sick. And as we also heard from the event that night, more and more of the heroin is now laced with fentanyl. Fentanyl is a very mm -hmm. powerful mm -hmm. painkiller, a yes. synthetic painkiller, right. uh, and when you mix the two, that's a, that's a dangerous combination. Right. So when you, it, just putting some numbers to it, you know, fentanyl is, is anywhere from 50 to 100 times more powerful than the heroin itself. The dealers will cut it with whatever it is that they can cut it with because their job is to keep you, is to keep you addicted. And so they, they will cut it with things that are actually more addictive, more, more powerful, but on that, not only is it more powerful from a getting a high standpoint, it's also more powerful from all the side effects, including, including potentially death. And we're seeing that. A lot of overdoses mm -hmm. now are cases where the heroin has been laced with fentanyl and, and people have overdosed and died. Yes, that's absolutely true. You're seeing this every day. Oh, yes. Yes. And we heard from the city police officer the night of the event how accessible uh, heroin uh, other opiates are in our community and it's scary so I mean in terms of our coalition one of the, it, we're focusing on a number of areas but prevention and education are certainly two ingredients of our, of our mission. We know that some of the speakers that were at your event are speaking in the schools mm -hmm. reaching out to kids what do you see for the next several months in the coming years for this coalition to continue to get the community involved and, and raise the awareness? Mm -hmm. Well, the school piece, at least, you know, we're trying, Peru Central mm -hmm. School, a, a week before Chasing the Dragon, actually did Chasing the Dragon it, through an mm -hmm. assembly format for all <coughs> 7 through 12 grade students. And Jason and Officer Chris Clark spoke to the students. And it was very impactful. And we're hoping that we can get, you know, before the end of the year, we're hoping um, that we get that assembly in every school district in our area. And frankly, all the school districts have reached out <coughs> to try to figure out how we can do that and when is the best time to do that. So our hope is to get Chasing the Dragon and Jason and Officer Clark to talk about the realities for them. Um, because I think really, if kids realize what it is to get hooked on opiates or heroin, it's a big thing. They, it will start to be, you know, common knowledge that, boy, I don't want to try that because I don't know what that's going to do to me. You know, that's one area. Education in the schools is one area we're going in. But I think there's a lot of areas we're going right. in as far as raising community education. And, and certainly, I, you know, I can't bring it back enough about trying to destigmatize addiction. Is the community successfully doing that? Yes, police are still going after the dealers who are bringing massive yes. amounts of heroin mm -hmm. in. But for the people, the addicts, the majority of the addicts, law enforcement, the health community and others are saying that this is uh, a disease and we need to treat this as, as a health epidemic, not as uh, criminals and, and, and 
prosecuting them and putting them behind bars. And and we and we're working on on that as part of the coalition also. You know, how how can we all work together in ways that maybe we're not working together now, but to but to actually get people into a treatment area as opposed to getting them into um, jail. A lot of us historically have worked in silos. You know, healthcare has been a silo, DSS has had their thing, uh, certainly law enforcement has been in their silo, and the same thing for treatment. The wonderful thing that's come out of this coalition is air silo walls are coming down. We're working together in ways that I wouldn't have dreamed possible four or five years ago. We hear detox and we hear rehab. And a lot of people may not understand the difference. Could you help us out with that? Well, there's different levels of detox. Uh, there's an inpatient detox, which is really for the person who has some significant medical issues going on, and they really need to be in the environment of a, a hospital-based detox to get safely withdrawn uh, until they're able to be discharged. Um, there's ancillary detox, which can be done in outpatient clinics. And in Schuyler Falls, when uh, we plan to open up what's called an 820 stabilization, which is a withdrawal service, and a rehab. Um, so we will, be, we will be doing withdrawal services in Schuyler Falls for individuals that don't have acute medical issues going on. So someone may be in the hospital emergency department and they're medically cleared, and they would be appropriate to come to a place like Schuyler Falls to finish the withdrawal and to be assessed and to figure out what their next level of care needs to be and whether or not they're a good candidate for medication-assisted treatment. So the withdrawal is the detox phase and yeah. then the uh, rehab. rehab is a longer term program. It will. Right now, are those options available in Clinton County or is the, the unit that you're going to be opening uh, hopefully by the end of this year yep. in Schuyler Falls, is that going to be the first in Clinton County that will be both detox and rehab? That will be the first OASIS licensed uh, service uh, in Clinton County. And, you know, a couple of minutes ago I talked about how easily accessible heroin is. Treatment for residents in Clinton County hasn't been easily accessible. I mean, that's been a huge barrier to engaging a client in the services that they need when they need it. So this is going to really fill a huge void. Will the 16 beds make a difference or are even more needed here? I know New York State is committed, the governor's been committed, there's been money in the yep. budget the past couple of years to expand treatment across the state, but uh, how much of a difference will 16 beds make, but how many more realistically are needed uh, in an area like Clinton County? It's difficult to tell how many more will be needed. I would say after we're operationalized for a year, then we'll have a, a much better handle on the ongoing need. And tell us a little bit about Schuyler Falls. Uh, so it'll be 16 beds altogether, combination detox rehab, right. uh, even number of beds or? Uh, no, I, th I think we're gonna have the flexibility to be able to uh, have beds whatever in whatever fashion that the clients are going to need them. Uh, we're going to have two operating certificates up there, one for the stabilization and the other one for the rehabilitation. So we're going to have that flexibility and, and quite frankly that's the way we designed it. 